Chapter 11 The River Rises During this big rise, these small fry craft were an intolerable nuisance. We were running shoot after shoot, a new world to me, and if there was a particularly cramped place in a chute, we would be pretty sure to meet a broadhorn there. And if he failed to be there, we would find him in a still worse locality, namely, the head of the chute and on shoal water. And then there'd be no end of profane cordialities exchanged. Sometimes in the big river, when we'd be feeling our way cautiously along through a fog, the deep hush would suddenly be broken by yells and a clamor of tin pans, and all an instant a log raft would appear vaguely through the webby veil close upon us. And then we did not wait to swap knives, but snatched our engine bells out by the roots and piled on all the steam we had to scramble out of the way. One doesn't hit a rock or a solid log craft with a steamboat when one can get excused. You'd hardly believe it, but many steamboat clerks always carried a large assortment of religious tracts with them in those old departed steamboating days. Indeed, they did. Twenty times a day we'd be cramping up around a bar while a string of these small fry rascals were drifting down into the head of the bend, way above and beyond us a couple of miles. Now a skiff would dart away from one of them and come fighting its laborious way across the desert of water. It would ease all in the shadow of our forecastle, and the panning oarsman would shout, Give me a paper, as the skiff drifted swiftly astern. The clerk would throw out a file of New Orleans journals, and if they were picked up without comment, he might notice that now a dozen other skiffs had been drifting down upon us without saying anything. You understand, they'd been waiting to see how number one was going to fare. Number one making no comment, all the rest would bend their oars and come on now. And as fast as they came, the clerk would heave out neat bundles of religious tracts tied to shingles. The amount of hard swearing which twelve packages of religious literature will command when impartially divided up among twelve raftsmen's crews you have pulled a heavy skiff two miles on a hot day to get them is simply incredible. As I've said, the big rise brought a whole new world under my vision. By the time the river was over its banks, we had forsaken our old paths and were hourly climbing over bars that stood ten feet out of the water before. We were shaving stumpy shores like that at the foot of Madrid Bend, which had always seen avoided before. We were clattering through chutes like that of 82, where the opening at the foot was an unbroken wall of timber till our nose was almost at the very spot. Some of these chutes were utter solitudes. The dense, untouched forest overhung both banks of the crooked little crack, and one could believe that human creatures have never intruded there before. The swinging grapevines, the grassy nooks and vistas, glimpses we swept by, the flowering creepers waving their red blossoms from the tops of dead trunks, and all the spendthrift richness of the forest foliage were wasted and thrown away there. The chutes were lovely places to steer in. They were deep, except at the head. The current was gentle. Under the points, the water was absolutely dead, and the invisible banks so bluff that were the tender willow thickets projected, you could bury your boat's broadside in them as you tore along, and then you seemed fairly to fly. Behind other islands, we found wretched little farms and wretcheder little log cabins. There were crazy rail fences sticking a foot or two above the water, with one or two jeans-clad, chills-racked, yellow-faced male miserables roosting on the top rail, elbows on knees, jaws in hands, grinding tobacco, and discharging the results at floating chips through crevices left by lost teeth. While the rest of the family and the few farm animals were huddled together in an empty wood flat riding at her moorings close at hand. In this flat boat, the family would have to cook and eat and sleep for a lesser or greater number of days, or possibly weeks, 
until the river should fall two or three feet and let them get back to their log cabin and their chills again, chills being a merciful provision of an all-wise providence to enable them to take exercise without exertion. And this sort of watery camping out was a thing which these people were rather liable to be treated to a couple times a year. By the December rise out of the Ohio and the June rise out of the Mississippi, and yet these were kindly dispensations, for they at least enabled the poor things to rise from the dead now and then, look upon life when the steamboat went by. They appreciated the blessing, too, for they spread their mouths and eyes wide open and made the most of these occasions. Now what could these banished creatures find to do to keep from dying of the blues during the low-water season? Once in one of these lovely island chutes, we found our course completely bridged by a great fallen tree. This will serve to show how narrow some of these chutes were. The passengers had an hour's recreation in virgin wilderness, while the boat hands chopped the bridge away. But there was no such thing as turning back, you comprehend. From Cairo to Baton Rouge, when the river is over its banks, you have no particular trouble in the night, for a thousand-mile wall of dense forest that guards the two banks all the way is only gapped with a farm or woodyard opening at intervals, and so you can't get out of the river much easier than you could get out of a fenced lane. But from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, it's a different matter. The river is more than a mile wide and very deep, as much as 200 feet in places. Both banks for a good deal over hundred miles are shorn of their timber and bordered by continuous sugar plantations, with only here and there a scattering sapling or a row of ornamental china trees. The timber is shorn off clear to the rear of the plantations from two to four miles. When the first frost threatens to come, the planters snatch off their crops in a hurry. When they have finished grinding the cane, they form the refuse of the stalks, which they call bagasse, into great piles and set fire to them. Though in other sugar countries, the bagasse is used for fuel in the furnaces of the sugar mills. Now the piles of damp bagasse burn slowly and smoke like Satan's own kitchen. An embankment ten or fifteen feet high guards both banks of the Mississippi all the way down to that lower end of the river, and this embankment is set back from the edge of the shore from ten to perhaps a hundred feet, according to circumstances. Say thirty or forty feet is a general thing. Fill that whole region with an impending gloom of smoke for a hundred miles of burning bagasse piles when the river is over the banks and turn a steamboat loose along there at midnight and see how she will feel. And see how you will feel, too. you find yourself away out in the midst of a vague, dim sea that is shoreless, that fades out and loses itself in the murky distances. For you cannot discern the thin rib of embankment, and you are always imagining you see a straggling tree when you don't. The plantations themselves are transformed by the smoke and look like part of the sea. All through your watch, you're tortured with the exquisite misery of uncertainty. You hope you're keeping in the river, but you do not know. All that you're sure about is that you're likely to be within six feet of the bank and destruction when you think you're a good half a mile from shore. And you are sure, also, that you chance suddenly to fetch up against the embankment and topple your chimneys overboard. You will have the small comfort of knowing that it is about what you were expecting to do. One of the great Vicksburg packets darted out into a sugar plantation one night at such a time and had to stay there a week. But there's no novelty about it. It had been often done before. I thought I'd finish this chapter, but I wish to add a curious thing while it's on my mind. It is only relevant in that it's connected with piloting. There used to be an excellent pilot on the river, a Mr. X, who was a somnambulist. It was said that if his mind was troubled about a bad piece of river, he was pretty sure to get up and walk in his sleep and do strange things. 
He was once fellow pilot for a trip or two with George Ealer on the great New Orleans passenger packet. During a considerable part of the first trip, George was uneasy, but got over it by and by, as X seemed to be content to stay in his bed when asleep. Late one night, the boat was approaching Helena, Arkansas. The water was low, and the crossing above the town in a very blind and tangled condition. X had seen the crossing since Ealer had, and as the night was particularly drizzly, sullen, and dark, Ealer was concerning whether he had better not have X called to assist in running the place. When the door opened and X walked in. Now on very dark nights, light is a deadly enemy to piloting. You are aware that if you stand in a lighted room on such a night, you cannot see things in the street to any purpose. But if you put out the lights and stand in the gloom, you can make out objects in the street pretty well. So on very dark nights, pilots do not smoke. They allow no fire in the pilot house stove. If there is a crack which can allow at least a ray to escape, they order the furnaces to be curtained, with, lo with huge tarpaulins and the skylights to be closely blinded. Then no light whatever issues from the boat. The indefinable shape that now entered the pilot house had Mr. X's voice. This said, let me take her, George. I've seen this place since you have, and it's so crooked that I reckon I can run it myself easier than I can tell you how to do it. It is kind of you, and I swear I am willing. I haven't got another drop of perspiration left in me. I've been spinning around and around the wheel like a squirrel. It's so dark I can't tell which way she's swinging till I come in like a whirligig. So Wheeler took a seat on the bench, panting and breathless. The black phantom assumed the wheel without saying anything, steadied the waltzing steamer with a tune or two, and then stood at ease, coaxing her little to this side and then to that, as gently and as sweetly as if the time had been noonday. When Wheeler observed this marvel of steering, he wished he had not confessed. He stared and wondered and finally said, well, I thought I knew how to steer a steamboat, but that was another mistake of mine. X said nothing, but went serenely on with his work. He rang for the leads. He rang to slow down the steam. He worked the boat carefully and neatly into invisible marks that stood at the center of the wheel and peered blandly out into the darkness fore and aft to verify his position. As the leads shoaled more and more, he stopped the engines entirely, and the dead silence and suspense of drifting followed. When the shoalest water was struck, he cracked on the steam, carried her handsomely over, and then began to work her warily into the next system of shoal marks. The same patient, heedful use of leads and engines followed. The boat slipped through without touching bottom and entered upon the third and last intricacy of the crossing. Imperceptibly, she moved through the gloom, crept by inches into her marks, drifted tediously till the shoalest water was cried, and then on her tremendous head of steam went swinging over the reef away into deep water and safety. Eeler let out long pent breath pour out of his great relieving sigh and said, that's the sweetest piece of piloting that was ever done on the Mississippi River. I wouldn't believed it could have been done if I hadn't seen it. There was no reply, and he added, Just hold her five minutes longer, partner. Let me run down and get a cup of coffee. A minute later, Ealer was biting into a pie down in the Texas and comforting himself with coffee. Just then the night watchman happened, and it was about to happen out again when he noticed Ealer and exclaimed, who is at the wheel, sir? X. Dart for the pilot house quicker than lightning. The next moment both men were flying up the pilot house companionway three steps at a jump. Nobody there. The great steamer was whistling down the middle of the river at her own sweet will. The watchman shot out of the place again. Eeler seized the wheel, set an engine back with power, and held his breath while the boat reluctantly swung away from a towhead which was about to knock into the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. By and by, the watchman came back and said, 
Didn't that lunatic tell you he was asleep when he first came up here? No. Well, he was. I found him walking along top of the railings, just as unconcerned as another man would walk a pavement, and I put him to bed. Now, just this minute, there he was again, way astern, going through that sort of tight-rope deviltry, the same as before. Well, I think I'll stay by next time he has one of those fits. But I hope he'll have them often. You just ought to have seen him take this boat through Helena Crossing. I never saw anything so gaudy before. And if he could do so gold-leaf, kid-glove, diamond-breastpin piloting when he was sound asleep, what couldn't he do if he was dead?